Hello, YouTube. Hello, Brian. Hey. Hey, great to see you. It's Super to exciting to be you. here. Hi, Will. Hi. hi, Will. Hi, Ollie. Hi, Brandon. Hey, everyone out in the audience. It's really great. We always love that you show up and ask questions and whatnot. And yeah, happy to have you here. Let's kick this thing off. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 282, recorded May 3rd, 2022. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I am Brian Aachen. It's great to have you here, Brian. It's just us, just the two of us. Yeah, just Although, like old times. I know, but we have our, our friends out in the audience, so we're not entirely alone. It's, it's great. Yeah. So let's kick it off. I'm. I know you have a particularly exciting announcement uh topic to cover here so yeah definitely let's, let's go do it okay so um PyScript. so this was a, an announcement at pycon us by uh anaconda's ceo peter wang uh during a keynote i wasn't there but like everybody was tweeting about it so it almost felt like i was i was there so um uh but but i i haven't seen the presentation so i can't wait can't wait till that goes online. So uh, I know are the videos. I have not seen the videos for the presentations at PyCon out yet. Are they out yet? And I just missed it. I haven't. So, looked, is my YouTube but... broken? <laughs> it should be full of this stuff. But like, what's up with? Is it supposed to be next day or something? I don't know. I know. I know. Anyway, I would have loved to live stream it, but I, I didn't see an option. So anyway, yeah. I'm looking forward to watching this one in particular when it comes out because this is big news. So PyScript is Python in the browser. Um, so what does that mean? It is built on top of Pyodide, which is a port of CPython based on web, web assembly. I'm pretty sure we've covered Pyodide before, but um, so this is a pretty neat thing. And one of the things that this, um, so the PyScript.net, if you go to it, it's got a little, it's kind of actually, if it's, it's like hype and it sounds neat and you can do Python in the browser. Neat with the PyScript tags. But what does that mean? So there's a, if you go down to the bottom, there's a GitHub. Uh, repo that you can go look at this is what i suggest and this will talk about um, there's a getting started guide um, but what i did is uh, just followed this um, i cloned the repo and then i went in and did the in, into the javascript area and then did npm install and then did this dev run run dev thing so this will only take me like five minutes to get this far and um and what you have is you've got one of the things that it has is it has an examples folder and you can just open this up now in your local your local browser local host um and there's all these cool demos like there's a a repl where you can just do it's kind of like um uh jupiter where you can say like x equals three let's do this uh and then x and then if i do shift enter it evaluates it how neat is that that's pretty oh, that's neat. awesome yeah um to do app here so Make sure you listen to our podcasts. Go buy Python testing with PyTest. We'll check that because we know you've already bought that. So, um, and then uh, here's an example with D3 uh, graphics. This is neat. I, I don't think I've ever done this. Uh, there's an Altair example, and this is pretty fun because you click around and it changes the above. It's like an interactive thing. Uh, this is fun. I we we use Altair at, at, with a project at work, so this is neat. Um, the Mandelbrot set. So there's some code. So all of this code is in the repo. So you can look at the examples and look exactly how the code is done. There's a HTML file and a Python file for all of these. Um, so you can check it out. Actually, I don't know about the Python thing. It's 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 HTML and Python within the HTML code embedded. So there isn't a separate file. But you have you can do imports and all this sort of stuff too. Um, oh, I went too far. But I wanted to bring up, there's also an article that we're going to link to in the show notes that is called um, uh, PyScript, Unleash the Power of Python in Your Browser. Um, this is by Eric Lewis Lewinson, and um, it runs through, it's it's a pretty interesting uh, little quick read of what it is if you're not familiar with uh, WebAssembly and PyDide. So it's nice. So it's, what, do you, what do you think, so Michael? Excited. I am very excited. You know... There's been progress on the WebAssembly plus Python side on several occurrences that were, they give you a sense of what's possible, but they didn't give you a thing to build with. You know what I yeah. mean? They, yeah. So for example, Pyodide is awesome, but it's kind of like, 
well, if I want to sort of host Jupyter kernel in my browser, like I can, I can kind of do that, right? Um, the WebAssembly Python itself is great, but it doesn't specify a way to have a UI of your web page interact with Python. It's just, oh, you could execute Python over here. Well, like, and then what? You know what I mean? Which is, which is still good, but there's not something where like I can have a button on there that like wires up to this thing in Python and I can have this list that binds in and that way and so on. Yeah. And this looks like we might be there. Like one of the things they talk about on the page is not just running Python in the browser and the Python ecosystem, as you pointed out, but really importantly, two more things, Python with JavaScript, bi-directional communication between Python and JavaScript objects. Yeah. So you can wire into like events on the page and other uh, DOM type of things. And yeah, then so a visual ap application development ties in with that with uh, use readily available curated UI components such as buttons, containers, text boxes, and more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like these are just a little quick examples, but I'd love to see some, some uh, bigger examples of things like that, like uh, being able to connect... Um, uh, it you know yeah JavaScript interaction with uh, stuff on on the Python side that'll be neat. Yeah, it's weird to see Python written just straight in the browser. You know, like yeah. here you have like angle bracket pi dash script and then just import anti gravity anti gravity dot fly. <laughs> and like wait, what? <laughs> well, so this this is a good example. I, I picked this example for one is because it does it do, do an import. So this it, there's like a path thing. You so you can set up. So you can put code. You can put code. All your code doesn't have to be in HTML. It can be in in a Python file. So you can debug it there, which that's where you want to debug it. And then you can yeah. import it and call it within Python. And this is this is probably more where I would use it is uh, putting most of my code somewhere else and then. Yeah, that's what I want to see. I would want to see just Python files and just a, effectively a script tag for it. I mean, you probably maybe you can't do it directly as a script tag, but you could do you know bracket yeah. pi script and then just import and run, right? It's called the yeah. Point, so basically. I haven't looked at this before. So the anti gravity dot pi that is uh, bringing in is bringing in some piodide stuff and uh, uh, be, to be able to work it. So, I'm seeing some okay. from. Um, doc, this is Python code from document or sorry, from JS import document and yeah. set interval. And those are the things you do there. Uh, let's see. Are there any, any callbacks? I don't see any callbacks there. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. This set interval has a callback self dot move when the interval, the JavaScript interval fires. So under, under fly that is, uh, hooking into a timer there. Oh, timer yeah. callback. So we should check that out. So where's, where's that? Um, so the uh, anti gravity. I should have done this ahead of time. <laughs> the the anti gravity is not linked to, but I'll just like bring it up. Anti gravity based on. <laughs> wow! Oh my gosh! This is so amazing. People have to do this. Oh, <laughs> this is cool. We all know import anti gravity, and we've got to know the XKCD that comes up. But yes, this is having so it good. animated. Oh, it's That's alive! Great. It's not just is the person who who says, "How are you flying?" The the person says, "I'm playing with Python." Like that thing is alive and cruising around. I love it, and yeah. that's based on the callback, right? That's that's calling Python based on the set interval uh, timer callback in JavaScript. Yep. Yeah. And, and to me, that has been the missing piece. Like, how do I wire up? It's like great if I can just execute python and have you know like a number come out but what i want is view in python or reactive i want to build the ui in python and just not deal with javascript and be able to do so many more things uh, on the front end i mean this opens up stuff like uh progressive web apps which yeah. could be really amazing for the python space right like I'm here in Vivaldi. If I go to my email client, just in the browser, I can right click and install. It gets its own app that works offline. It like pulls its data down into the local DB or whatever. Theoretically, you could do this, right? You could pull down the yeah. CPython WASM. You could pull down the 5K Pi script file and then just somehow use JavaScript to Python to talk to local DBs. I mean, what if we get like ORMs? In Python, going oh yeah, we have one of our backends is the web browser, uh, local DB, yeah, or something. That would I mean this is great. I would love. I'm very excited for where this might go. 
sky's the limit, right? That's what that little flying character is <laughs> saying, at least. Yeah. Okay. So, well, okay. good job, Anaconda folks. And uh, I believe this was Fabio and, and crew. So, really, really nice. That was super psyched. How am I going to follow that one up, Brian? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. No, I've got some good items. They're just not flying around amazing Python in the browser. Amazing. So, Bloomberg has a lot of Python going on and Bloomberg actually has a pretty cool like tech engineering blog where they talk about some of the stuff going on at Bloomberg, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the really good articles I read from this, uh, from them was about how to really set up and run micro whiskey in production. And it was like this huge, long, deep list of like, here's a bunch of flags you probably never thought about. And here's why you should care about them in Python. Really good stuff. So they're back with another thing that they use that is cool called memory like memory mm -hmm. but memory and it is a memory profile for python so if you want to understand the performance of your application especially around memory here's a pretty neat tool now let me just get this right out of the way before i forget linux only so if you're not using linux just close your ears no just kidding like you could all, if you're on Windows, you could just run your Python app under WSL and then profile it and then go back to running it on Windows. <laughs> or if you're on Mac, just do a VM or something, right? Anyway, it only runs on Linux, but because Python is so similar across the platforms, I'm sure you could just test your code there, even if that's not the main use case. All right, so you get all these different visualizations of memory usage. It can track allocations for Python code in native extension modules like numpy or something like that and even within cpython itself so you get sort of a holistic view of the memory which is pretty awesome yeah yeah and it'll give you uh, different memory reports we'll talk about them a little bit and you can use it as a cli tool just like kind of like time it or whatever you can just say memory run my app and then when your app exits it's like and here's what happened one of the things that's super challenging about complicated applications and web apps and stuff is you want to focus on a particular scenario and there's so much overhead of like startup and, and other things. So for example, if I just want to uh, profile a fast API API call, if I just say run it up and then I go hit that API, all of the infrastructure starting up UV Acorn and Fast API and Python. It just like it just dwarfs whatever that little thing is usually. So there's also a programmable API that says, you know, you could create like a context manager. Like I don't know if it actually is that way, but you could certainly build it if it doesn't exist, like with <laughs> with memory profile here and just do a little block of code and then get an answer, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, Alvaro asks if it accepts an entry point. Uh, I suspect you could call an entry point. Uh, because you just do the run on the command prompt. So you could probably yeah, pass that whatever over. You, whatever you run. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. But the problem is there's still like the startup of just CPython itself, right? Mm. Like I always find just the imports and all that is just way more overhead than, you know, it clog clutters it up. Anyway, let's hit some notable features of Memray. It traces every function call as opposed to samplings. It, so instead of just going every millisecond, what do you do now? What do you do now? Let's just record that, right? It actually exactly traces so you don't miss any functions being called, even if they're brief. It handles native calls in C++ libraries, so the entire stack is represented in the results, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's pretty neat. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, pretty dope. Apparently, it's blazing fast. There's some kind of character. I think it's a race car there. Uh, it causes minimal slowdown in the app. If you're doing Python tracing, if you do the native code stuff, it's a little bit slower, it says, but that's optional. You get a bunch of reports. We'll see those in minutes. It works on Python threads. So you can see, <laughs> I know all these people watching, but if you check out the web page. There's a little thread, like a sewing thread emoji for works on thread. Twitter thread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. So it also works on native threads, like C threads and native extensions, which it represents as an alien plus. <laughs> <laughs> the thread icon. I love it. Alien threads. Yeah. 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 So let's look over here real quick. 
Uh, we'll look at just, I guess, the reporting, right? I mean, the running is super simple, as I said. Memray run Python file with arguments or memray run dash M module with arguments. Yeah. These are the places you could put your entry point and so on. And and Dean in the audience says we've had a rich spotting. Okay, I haven't I haven't pulled that up yet, but very nice. So there's different ways in which you can view it. And the first one that I ran across, which is pretty interesting, if you're familiar with glances or you want to go old school like top or one of these things, you can run in just the terminal and get like a not really with rich, uh, not rich, uh, not rich uh, with top, but uh, rich output like uh, glances is you can run it in a live mode where while it's running, it'll show you what's happening with the memory. That is so awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 So instead of just showing you a memory graph, it's like, guess what? We're running here right now with this many allocations and, and so on. Yeah. Like that looks super neat. And, just give it a dash dash line. And if you've got something interactive, you can interact with it and watch the memory change then. So yeah. Yeah. You can cycle through threads. You can sort by total memory or its own memory of um, the that's a common thing you do in profiling like this and all the stuff it's called or just this method itself sort by allocations versus memory usages and all kinds of stuff so that's really neat it will track um, the allocations across forks as in process sub process so oh, why would okay. you care because multi-processing if you want to track some kind of multi-processing memory workflow, it'll actually do that. It just you do dash dash follow fork and it'll like aggregate the stats across the different processes. Kind of insane. Um, let's see if we can get down here and you can do, they have the summary reporter, which is kind of a, a nice, just, you know, this is probably what you would expect. Flame graphs. If I can get down here somewhere, it'll show it like, sort of the color and the width of these bars will show you how significant it is. There's a nice tree version that'll show you the biggest 10 allocations and then a call stack sort of in and out with trees and like how much memory is being allocated in each one of those and so on. So that's nice. Yeah. This is a nice app, right? Nice uh, little utility. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So if you want to track down memory leaks or you're just wondering like why is my program using so much memory fired up let it run for a while see what happens yeah cool all right back to you brian well i want to bring up a, a pytest tool so um it was a i i have a recent i've often used a pytest x dist uh for parallel so x dist is a way you could just say that it, it's it's the one that I heard about first for running PyTest in parallel. So you've got, you know, like tons of unit tests maybe, and you want to just speed them up. Um, you can throw them, throw a dash N four or something like that at it. And it'll uh, just throw them, uh, launch different processes and, and run PyTest in parallel on a bunch of them. Um, so it cuts time down, but there's overhead. Uh, and, I was recommending this to somebody on Twitter and, um, and there was, a, I think it was Bruno Oliveira um, suggested a couple of alternatives. And one of them was PyTest parallel, which um, I, I, I know I've run across, but I haven't played with it for a while. So I tried it out and it's actually like really cool. So one of the, one of the PyTest X does, does a lot. One of the things it does is it not just, uh, uh, it's not just multiprocessor, but it can be on different actual different computers. So you can launch them up. Oh, nice. Um, like great uh, computing almost, huh? Yeah, you can SSH into uh, different systems and have it run in parallel. Um, but that, you know, you don't, I don't usually need that kind of power. Um, the one thing it doesn't do is thread. So it's, it's process based mm -hmm. and PyTest Parallel does both. So you can say, um, you can give it, uh, you can give it a, well, where we have, I'm going to go down to the examples. So you can give it number of workers and it'll tell it to, um, that's how many uh, processes it'll spin up or how many CPUs. Um, now you can also give it tests per worker and then it'll run in multi-threading mode um, and you can give it auto on both of these. And it's a, this is extremely useful for <laughs> you have to by default this is turned off by default the, the the features if you just say workers equals five or something it won't do multiple threat multi-threading and the reason is 
it, because you need to make sure your tests are thread safe. Um, and many are not. So I tried it on a couple right. of Even my Even if they're isolated, they might not be thread safe, right? Like, yes. It's um, another level of consideration. However, if there are, there's a lot of small, especially small, uh, not really unit like system tests, but a lot of unit tests are just testing a little Python code. If you've got a part of that is a lot of projects, that's a big chunk of the test load. So being able to do multi-threading is really nice. But, you know, even with just multi-processing, I tried this on a few different projects and there were like, I tried it on Flask and the, um, uh, the, the parallel version that using PyTest Parallel was like three times faster than the Exodus version. So, oh, wow. um, so based on your, I there's and there was another one that uh, Bruno mentioned, but I think these two are really solid Exodus and Parallel. So if you want to speed up your test run times, I would try both on your project and just see play with them and see see which one's faster. On uh, many of the projects I tried, Parallel was at least as fast or faster than Xdist. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, that's cool. This looks great. I like it. And having your test run faster is always good. Do you do anything crazy? Like, do you set up your editor to auto run tests on file change or anything like that? Um, it, sometimes. Uh, one of the I've things always, I've done it a few times, but it always makes me nervous. I'm like, ah, just like it's unnerving to me that it just keeps running. Uh, one of the th the things that I really like around uh, that was added to PyTest not too long ago was um, is stepwise. So that's not really all the running it all the time, but um, stepwise will, and this would be a handy one to to run all the time. So what stepwise does is it takes you can run all your tests at, if in stepwise, and when you run it again. It'll start at the first failing test because it assumes you're trying to fix something. It'll start at that and then run until it finds a failure. So if you ha if you haven't fixed this first failure, it'll just keep running that one until you fixed it, and it'll go to the next one. Um, and uh, so I do that a lot while I'm trying to debug something. Oh, that's um, cool. And and hooking that up with like an auto like a watch feature. There's a bunch of ways you can watch your code to to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Nice. Very cool. So let's do some real time follow up here. First, Alvaro is being all mischievous, asking, "I wonder what would happen if I install both plugins, both Xdist and Parallel." I, you could. I don't know if I've. You can run them at the same time. I should try. I have it installed on like the Flask one. I ran it. I installed both of them and then tried them both, but not at the same time. Forks, it's forks. It's gonna go so fast. <laughs> and then just going back to PyScript, there's like tons of excitement about PyScript. RJL is yeah. excited. Brandon's excited. Um, and David says, I hope someday I, I can say, back in my day, you couldn't just learn Python. You had to learn JavaScript too. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, let's see. So I got one more to cover that is going to be fun as well. And this one comes to us from former uh, guest co-host, uh, Michael Feigert. Uh, sorry, Matthew Feigert. And Matthew is a great supporter of the show, sends all sorts of interesting things in to help us out and good ideas. And this is yet another one coming from the data science side of things, saying, you know, one of the things you have to do often in, say, a Jupyter Notebook is go download a file off of an API or just some link or S3 bucket or whatever, and you want to process it. And if you use requests while great, you end up making the request, verifying that it worked, reading the stream into bytes, writing the bytes to a file, uh, picking a file name, and then using that file name to open it, and then say, now you can process it, right? So yeah. there's this thing called Pooch, a friend to fetch your data files. All right, Pooch, go get, go get my files. Like a little, a little uh, friendly dog that also seems to hold a snake in its mouth. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, who wouldn't want uh, a dog that can wrangle snakes to go help you with your notebooks. Anyway, the idea is you can do all of what I described with requests. You can do that in one line of code. Oh, wow. Yeah, and you get other cool features as well. So um, it says, look, you can just make this one function call and it'll save it and it'll also cache your files locally. So some of these files that data scientists especially work with are massive, right? You know, it's like a gig and 
every time you run the notebook, you don't want it to download the gig again. You just want it to run more quickly. So you can set up a location for it to cache it. Uh, you can pass in a hash of the file to say, I want to get this file and I expect it to be this MD5 or whatever the heck the hash is that they're using so that you can be sure it doesn't change, right? So if you're doing like reproducible data science, you say, what you do is you download this file, then you apply this algorithm, then you get this picture. Well, if the data changes, I bet the picture changes, right? And so you can put it like a, a layer of verification that it's unchanged from the last time you decided what it should be. That's hmm. pretty cool. You can do multiple uh, protocols. So not just HTTP, HTTPS, but FTP. And, oh my gosh, SFTP. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's well it's basic auth. It'll also automatically resolve uh, DOIs, uh, digital object identifiers, which are used in places like Figshare and Zen, Zenodo. And this is about the re reproducible science. Like here's a, here's the file and like we've been assigned an immutable ID that we can always refer back to it. So you can just say, here's the ID and it'll actually get the file and it'll even unzip and decompress files upon download. Pretty, pretty neat, huh? Yeah, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Let me see if I can find an example of getting the same files. I like the 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 section of learning about it. It's called training your pooch. That's cute. Oh, nice! I love it. Apparently, it has progress bars, post download actions, login, and uh, you get multiple files. But the main use case is just file equals pooch dot retrieve URL done. That seems pretty nice. Yeah, that's great. It's my data. Here it is. Oh, cool. Uh, so Pamphil Roy on the audience says, hey, folks, funny, we're adding this to SciPy optional to have the, a SciPy data set sub module. Uh, Scikit image is using this as well. I had no oh, idea. Nice. Very cool. Thanks for the extra background there. Cool. Yeah. But I think this is great. In fact, I know it's, it sells itself. It builds itself as being for data science. I also like to download files sometimes and not go through <laughs> five or six lines of code. I could use this. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff that data science people are doing that we can use in lots of other fields. So indeed. I do think that's actually one of the really interesting aspects of Python is we have so many people from these different areas that it's not just all you know CS grads doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, those are my items for today, Brian. Uh nice. Um I I don't have any extras today. Do you have any extra information stuff? I do. I do have extras. So this one I'm very, very excited about. I have a new course that I just released Yay. called Up and Running with Git, a pragmatic UI-based introduction. So I'm, I'm really excited. I just released. I haven't really even announced it yet, but I finished getting it all public and online and turned all the GitHub repos public and all that stuff right before we jumped on the call today. And the idea is there are tons of Git courses. So why create a Git course? Well, I feel like so many of them are just like, okay, we're just going to work in the terminal or the command prompt. And you're just going to assume that like, that's the world of Git that you live in and like kind of yeah. at least common denominator approach. And while that, that is useful, like I don't think that's how most people are working, right? If you're in Visual yeah. Studio Code or PyCharm, like, there's great hockeys just to do the get stuff and see the history and whatnot. And there's other tools like source tree and tower and others. So it kind of takes this approach of like, well, let's take all the modern tools mm -hmm. that give you the best visibility and teach you get with that. So super fun. So we, which GUI tools are you using then? Or which um, ones are you sharing? Visual Studio Code, PyCharm, okay. source tree. Okay. Do the thing, and so I've I've done a lot of work. I've tried to take some of my uh, experience from doing some work on YouTube, where I was experimenting with like setup and uh, presentations and stuff. And I, I think I have a really neat, uh, polished experience for this course with like lots of cool visuals and graphics and video and stuff. So hopefully, people really enjoy it. Anyway, this is my extra. I, I just sent this out nice. to the world. Hopefully, people I'm love excited it. about this. Nice, congrats. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, you have no extras. Does that mean you're ready for some humor? Yes, always. All right. All right. This one, I, I chose this. Honestly, I just chose it, chose it just because of the title. So, um, 
there's Robert. Is this Robert Downing Jr. looking at somebody in like some kind of wizard situation, right? Like, oh, yeah, this is like Endgame or something. It, okay, yeah, I don't know the movie. Like, apparently, I watched stopped watching movies at some point, and now I don't. I'm out of touch. <laughs> So anyway, the title is when your code stopped working during an interview, or it could be a demo presentation or whatever. Like you want to, you want to tell us what this is about, what that's going on here. Well, so he's, he's, uh, he's looking back at uh, banner. So who's the Hulk he says, dude, you're embarrassing me in front of the wizards. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, yeah, because banner wasn't able to become the Hulk. So at the time, right, dude. Don't don't embarrass me in front of the wizards. I just I love to think of programmers as kind of like the modern day wizards. Like we can think of things and then poof, they they kind of come into existence. <laughs> so yeah, it's good. And then also while working on that Git course, I had this pretty fun experience. Like right <laughs> while I was recording it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there, and then um, Git was down. How often does GitHub itself go down? But no, oh no, there's like an oct the octacat is falling, like with a 500 sign in its hands, <sighs> which of course yeah. made me. I, I love that the, section, of course. Yeah, I like the expression on your face for that. It's like <laughs> yes, exactly. People seem to really like that tweet. All <laughs> I, it, I'll put it in the show notes so people can check it out. Anyway, dude, don't embarrass me in front of the wizards. <laughs> That's what I got for you. Yeah. Good. <laughs> good, so. good. Well, all right. Thanks. Thanks a lot again. It's a great show. Yeah, sure was. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for everyone who came. Bye.